partners as much about their, their values that they place on customer service. Well, you, I've just got to know you as that, and now you're that over there, but you've combined with them over there, and now you're this. And I look at it and I think, what is it you actually do? Hello, welcome back to the Irish Pod Sofa here at the CC Expo 2023 in London Excel. And we're recording this special series all about CX in 2024. What are the trends? What are the predictions? And I'm delighted to be joined in this episode by Steve McSherry, who's a country manager for Dactella UK. Steve, welcome to the comfy <laughs> podcast sofa. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be here. It's, uh, and it is comfortable. Yeah, yeah, I like it. It is. It's quite dangerous on the second day of this show as <laughs> yeah, well to yeah. kind of sink into this. So uh, we'll keep the energy in the conversation. Why don't you start by telling us about Dactella, what your role is, what the vision for the company is, and how we started to get working together. Yeah, if I take that in reverse order, it probably sure. makes more sense because to be fair to, to the relationship, actually the relationship was born out of a requirement we had because we have a support center and our agents in the support center were struggling because of background noise. So we trialed through all kinds of headsets from various costs to try and get the headset to solve the problem of background noise and didn't really do it. And then we chanced upon you guys at a show, uh, had a demonstration and thought, this is really good. And in the end, we then used your technology and it solved our problem. So then, obviously, from our point of view, we thought, this is a great way to take this to our customers. Because if it solves our problem, it solves our customers. Um, and go back to your first question, Dactella is a, a global company, a global company based in the Czech Republic. I'm responsible for the UK operation, and we've got two offices, one in Chester and one in Reading, which is where our support centre is based and which is where your product is installed. Excellent. And Dactella as a vision, as a company, as a service offering, you're bringing together technologies and integrating yeah. with your clients. Yeah, I, I, from our point of view, we, we, we provide our, our strap line for marketing is one app for all your customer communications. And that's really what we do. We, we provide one simple communications technology that allows customers to engage with their customers through any particular um, channel, be it voice, be it email, be it web chat, be it uh, WhatsApp, you, you name it. It all sits in our same desktop. So the agents on our system were able to deal with all different communication with all different customers through one common platform. And that in itself is, is at core of what we do. And in terms of the IP in that, in that platform, this particular episode is going to delve into the power of partnership yeah. and how that's evolving and something that's becoming ever more kind of prevalent in the market. Your platform is a combination of partner products and IP and, and your own. It is. I mean, we, we pride ourselves on the fact that we develop a lot of the software ourselves, hence the common software, one platform. Um, having said that, we appreciate there are other partners who have in-depth knowledge of areas that are complementary to what we do. So we see the contact center as being a core element of a customer communication strategy. But often, and in mo most situations that we deal with now, customers require other things that we don't necessarily do, but they want to work with us. So we therefore develop through our, uh, our um, APIs, integrations to appropriate technologies, such as Iris Clarity. Um, and we actually then are able to deploy those as, as a whole package within our contact center solution. So for us, partnerships are a key thing in a marketplace. We, we never really now come across an opportunity where somebody doesn't ask us to integrate to their CRM or to their speech analytics solution or to uh, all these different software platforms. And it's important that we're able to provide all of those uh, as one, one contract. I think if we, if we roll back a few years, partnerships were very much geared around opening up opportunities for... Um, more of a channel play and more of a sales lead gen play. Yeah. And it really has evolved into a partnership for simplicity for the end client in terms of how they might interface with, with a platform. How do you see partnerships as a concept in CX and any kind of business evolving as we go into 2024 and beyond? I, I think you've got to be careful with partnerships because there's a trend in our industry just to set up partnerships without really understanding how the two technologies complement each other and whether or not they're actually right for each other. So we take a very focused uh, view on partnerships. and We only sign up partners who we believe add value to our, our product, which means we can add value to our customers. 
Um, we are not intending to sign hundreds of partners as a company globally. Our intention is to provide uh, good quality partners who meet our aspirations during great customer service because we don't want to actually impact on our customer service by engaging with a partner who doesn't share our values. So selecting partners is as much about their, their values that they place on customer service as it is on the actual technology itself. Because it can be quite noisy, can't it? If, you, if you're, you've got a portfolio of all of these partners for your organization, it then takes a lot of management. You're, you know, you're spreading your bandwidth across all of these relationships and trying to keep everybody happy and probably ultimately laying all of them down and vice versa yeah. because we're not doing we're not investing the time and the energy into something that's going to truly create value and i think you know from our side certainly the same um we're having a very much less is more approach to things in in the partner landscape into 2024 i, I would agree and i think that's one of the things that actually attracted us to you as a partner because you, you shared a common view of the marketplace in 2024 I mean, your technology itself was groundbreaking, um, but it still means it's still going to be presented as part of the package. Uh, we obviously have a problem potentially with customers with background noise, so let's find a partner who solves that problem, and then let's introduce that partner to our customer. So that means that we're delivering a service to our customers by selecting the right partner to solve a problem they have and managing it through ourselves. But again, going back to what I said, we will only do that selectively uh, there is a number of our competitors out there who will literally sign up anybody as a partner just to get the uh, the marketing hype. Um, we don't really do that. What we tend to do is we tend to provide partnerships to our customers that add value to what we're providing to them. The brand piece is interesting, isn't it? Because it, you're in a partnership, almost there's a trust element. Yeah. Um, a, you mentioned the cultural piece, the brand piece, and are we representing one another in a way that, you know, I would treat your client as if, yep. you know, how I would treat my own client. That's a big factor, isn't it? Because there's a, there's a risk involved in this, that if you get it wrong and you partner with the wrong type of, of company or the wrong type of product, your brand is damaged. I, I agree. And that's, again, I, I'm probably restating what I've said, but that's why it's vital that we choose a partner who shares the same kind of ethos as we do about what is it you're trying to do what are you trying to deliver to your customers and um, if you're trying to deliver simply revenue then that's not necessarily a partnership that we want to engage in we want to engage in partners who are actually adding value to what we provide to our customers and as i say meet our own high standards of customer service yeah. and delivery is there a continued path of consolidation? It's one of the things that I was talking to Neris Caulfield yesterday, and she, she was talking about consolidation of this market. It's very noticeable at, at the event this year that there's, there's less stands. And one thing I'm wondering is, is that because some of these uh, companies have gone away uh, through consolidation or, or failure? Um, do you see the same? Do you see that this market has got a lot more room for consolidation? I, I do. I, I, I mean, at the show this year, I struggle sometimes, and I've been in the industry for the best part of 30 years, and I still struggle walking around the different stands. And I look at certain stands, and I look at it, and I think, what is it you actually do? I, I, I can't just determine from what you're presenting what it is you do. And that, to me, is, is quite frustrating because... It means that as if I'm somebody as a buyer who's wandering around here who hasn't got the level of knowledge and experience I have, you're going to get lost in the whole thing. And consolidation sometimes benefits because it reduces the number of suppliers, but then overcomplicates suppliers. I get, I get fed up of um, uh, companies changing their names, uh, which <laughs> seems to be the norm in our industry. Yeah. And you think to yourself, well, you, I've just got to know you as that, and now you're that over there, but you combine with them over there, and now you're this. And I think it gets very hard. So consolidation is, is in some respects, good when it's done right. But I think there's a number of new suppliers that can come into the marketplace and deliver really effective solutions alongside people like us who have the experience. Do you think a lot of that is born out of AI because everyone was kind of chasing this AI, whatever, whatever it was, you kind of scratch beneath the surface and go, oh, there's not much value under that. I do agree with your point. I think it's kind of, you know, uh, a bit of a di difficulty in really nailing a value proposition for a lot of it's like well it's AI so it yeah. must be good right yeah yeah 
Yeah, I think AI is one of those wonderful terms that, that has been used and bandied around for about a couple of years now in our industry. And I still don't think people truly understand how AI is used in our industry. I did a presentation yesterday uh, at one of the uh, theatres, and it was all about AI and the human touch. And it's how you use AI to enhance what your people do, not to replace what your people do. Because there is still a, a definite requirement in our industry for a human touch. People still need the reassurance of conversations with agents. And that's what the pandemic showed us in times of panic or crisis. I want to talk to somebody. Yeah, the rest of the time, I'll be quite happy going through an automation process. So it's, it's a balance. And don't just, don't just get drawn into the hype of, oh, AI, it's right for us. Well, is it right for your customers? Yeah. And that's the key thing. It might be right for you, but if it's wrong for your customers, it's going to have a detrimental effect on your business. We ran a panel yesterday on, uh, on voice premiumization of voice, this key insight that McKinsey have written a report on. What's your thoughts on voice? Is it declining, growing? Is it just staying the same? And how does it complement with the other services that you provide, for instance? You know, what component is voice in the mix of everything that you're doing? Um, I remember 10 years ago when people said voice is dead, the telephone is dead. Um, yeah. And I read last year's Contact Babel report, which said that 85% of call centers in the UK are still primarily based on voice, email, and web chat. So whilst the industry might think voice is dead, the, the customers don't think voice is dead. And again, I think the pandemic had some impact on this. Reassurance of speaking to somebody. Um, that's why telephone traffic started going up in the pandemic rather than having to go down. Um, I think there will always be a requirement for a voice solution. But I think as, uh, as generations develop, uh, for example, my youngest daughter probably would never dream of phoning a contact center. She would use WhatsApp or she may potentially SMS them. And that's how she would communicate. And I think it's important, therefore, that the people she's communicating with have to reflect that and address that demographic challenge, but also retain the, the requirement when things go wrong, I want to reach to the phone and speak to somebody. Um, so we still think voice is an important part to play. And in our contact center solution, voice is a key element of what we do. Um, I think you can take the voice and you can analyze it now much better than you could have done in the past through things like sentiment analysis, through things like speech analytics that we do and partner with people to do. Uh, and that gives you a lot of valuable information through that voice. So I think voice still has a very important part to play for, for the foreseeable future. Is it, um, is it something where the advancements in AI and generative AI, which is obviously the kind of big talking point, not just in the CX space, but, but more broadly at the moment, it's about the complementary nature of those technologies. And, you know, at the minute, my experience of automation in many instances is I have to go through that process in order to speak to somebody. Whereas I wonder if where this moves to is something where it's far more useful maybe solves more of my problems but then when i get to the agent if i do need to speak to somebody rather than repeating all that information again to them everything is a little bit more of a flow in terms of information um and doesn't exacerbate my frustrations with whatever situation but actually simplifies yeah. my life totally true i mean and it, it's a bit like if you attended the presentation i gave it was all about technology with the human touch and it was very much that it was having a voice bot to do the first initial part to gather the data, but then give the, the, the customer the option if they still wanted to speak to somebody, and then that person elected to speak to somebody, making sure that all the information you gathered through the voice bot is presented to the human agent for them to review before you then put the call through to the human agent. Yeah. And that gives the human agent the capability of saying, oh, I understand this, I understand that, I understand that, which is far better than saying, okay, where are we? And starting the whole process all over again. And then that human agent can use some of the AI tools that are available to actually improve how they deliver the service back to the end customer. Things like uh, ChatGPT, rewriting emails, that kind, of, that kind of technology is here today and making the service so much better. So I agree, there is, there's a place for AI, there is a place for the human being, and the human being 
can actually do the more complex things, leaving the AI tool to do the more simple things. Um, that's certainly what I see as the foreseeable future, and certainly in 2024, I see a lot more of that being developed. Excellent. Um, we're almost out of time. Let's uh, let's do our rapid fire um, round. I was afraid of this. You, you, the the questions have sometimes been rapid fire. The answers have been less have been less <laughs> quick to arrive at with other guests. But anyway, um, big tech prediction for 2024. What do you think is going to really kind of emerge? I do believe that AI linked to human beings will start taking come to the fore in 2024. I think there are significant benefits for AI. I just don't want companies to see AI as a way of replacing human beings. I want to see organizations seeing AI as a way of complementing the service that human beings can give. And I think that will happen in 2024. Um, what big bit of buzzword nonsense do you want to see disappear in 2024? I want to see the whole idea of eco-partners disappear because I think eco-partners is a very generic term. I would rather see that to replace with partnerships that add value to the customer. That, that's um, the most controversial one we've had so far, but I, I agree. Um, and uh, what's your left field prediction outside of CX? If we sit down in a year's time, what random prediction do you have for 2024? Do you know my random prediction for 2024? is that voice will still play a very, very important part in customer communication. Okay, I agree. Um, and then, uh, Steve, tell us something about you. What's the random thing that people don't know about you that you're willing to share? Um, I, I've literally started this company from a UK point of view, literally 10 years ago. Congratulations. And literally then we, we, we moved into the relationship with Dirk Teller, and now Dirk Teller has taken over the company that I started. But I am so, so committed to the team that we're building at Dactella, that for me personally, I'm just fascinated to see where this technology goes and where I can go with it. So, not sure that answers your question, Gavin, any, any secrets about me, um, but it does give you an indication about how passionate I am about this industry. Fantastic. Steve, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us your view of 2024 and beyond. And thank you for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back with more episodes in this CX24 predictions trends series we'll see you soon it's looking at every opportunity to reconfirm our commitment to the client it's that responsiveness the level of detail and the continuity it's a critical component of what we do